before we came to our building here, we started the Old Testament. And I told you we're going to take time with it because we're going to show the basis of uh, what our faith is built on. The New Testament church, they only had the Old Testament. New Testament wasn't written yet. And so we took a lot of time slowly. We built through it. And then the plan was to go into the New Testament, and the story happened. What we did in the story last year was we chronologically went through uh, the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation quick to get this overview of, of the Scripture, see the big story, how all of it fits together in one meta-narrative, one big, huge story. And then uh, we took, finished that up, took time for Christmas, and I've been taking several weeks, even including the Christmas messages, you probably noticed, to, a, to lay down, not this time an Old Testament base, but a logical, rational basis for our faith. Because we're starting the New Testament today, and what we're going to see in the New Testament is so amazing and so beautiful, so life-altering. We needed to know that this is not just, uh, well, that'd be nice, but we, we can trust this Bible, that this is rock solid, that what it tells us in here is not only worth believing, it's true. And so that's where we're going to go today. Uh, today, we're going to start off, and you know, in the I was asked if we're just going to take a quick chronological view of the Gospels uh, because the Gospels repeat and cover each other a lot. And we may do that a little bit with Mark. But I, my response was, no, we're going to go point by point, And we're going to take our time. And we're in the Gospels. And after the Gospels, going through the rest of the Scriptures, uh, New Testament. This is going to take us years. And I like that. Uh, if the Lord tarry, it, you know what? If Jesus comes back, we won't even get to finish. And I like that even better. Uh, but in this book, we're going to get to know Jesus. And, and I want you to think, so your, your second generation church, third generation church, you were not among the people that got to meet Jesus. But you're among the people that you're the first audience ever. Matthew Matthew chapter 1, you can turn there right now. Matthew, who was formerly a tax collector, became a follower of Jesus Christ, he wrote down this gospel. He wrote down this book so that we could know about the Jesus that he lived with and worked with. And imagine you're in that first church. You come in, you, you might be, if you're a Gentile, you might be wearing a toga or something. You're, you're wearing sandals. There's no air conditioning. There's no lights. On dark days, it's dark. And you sit down there, probably the men on one side, the women on the other side. That's the way they did church back then. And you're going to hear the words that Matthew wrote to tell us about Jesus Christ. We come to these scriptures and we say, yeah, I know about Jesus because I saw some movies about him. Or, or we've read our Bible before many times. I want us to try and approach this freshly. What an amazing impact these words would have had on those people. Uh, today's message is going to have tons of controversy. And I, I always like the way you guys perk up when you hear controversy. It's always, nobody goes to sleep on the days with controversy. So that's a good thing. Uh, there's many, many questions with uh, Matthew chapter 1 few answers, and just maybe, God willing, uh, it's going to help some of us deal with some doubts because it's real. People have approached the New Testament, say, I'm going to read the New Testament, and right in chapter 1, they stumble, and they quit reading. Well, one, God's, well, I hope it's okay to say God's weird. Uh, God is other than us. God's different. I would not have started a book that I'm trying to hook people with with a long genealogy. You know, read this. And it's going to start with the names of a lot of people you don't know. And people start going through this and they think, oh, I'm not going to be able to get the Bible uh, because they don't keep pushing. Well, this book is worth getting to know. So it's worth putting some effort into. And that's why we're going to be going slowly. Let's, uh, let's pray.
Heavenly Father, we, we give this time to you. Father, please uh, let this time be honoring to you, pleasing to you. Father, there's so many distractions, so many concerns, so many worries. Some things are good, but they can be a distraction. Some things are just scary and dark, and they can be a distraction. Father, help us to really uh, focus on you. And Lord, I pray that, uh, Lord, that you don't say, let me say anything, Lord, that would uh, cause people to miss you or to misunderstand you. Help me to uh, say and present you in a way that's very pleasing to you this morning, Lord God. Father, I ask that beyond the words that I preach, Lord, that we all are here expectant to, uh, expectant, Lord, that we believe that you're, get, you're here in our midst, that you're, you're here, Lord, holy God, in this place with us. And, Father, that we believe that the Holy Spirit can reach down inside of our spirits and uh, take a hold of us and draw us closer to you. I pray that you will do that this morning, Lord, that you accomplish your purposes this morning, Father, and that, Lord God, secondary It'd be really wonderful if we could have a better grip on Matthew chapter 1 when we leave here today. Thank you, God, for hearing this prayer. And thank you, God, uh, for always being with us. How good and wonderful that is. Amen. So we just finished uh, Christmas, and here we are back in uh, Matthew chapter 1. When Christ was born, the, uh, the region, Palestine, had been under Roman rule for only about 35 years. They had, uh, this was uh, the ragged edge of two empires, and they had just taken it back from the Parthians, who had previously taken it from the Romans, who had conquered the region under General Pompey. And I think a lot of you probably heard of Pompey because of the city that was named after him and covered with volcanic ash. So kind of fa some famous characters in there. World power in the Old Testament, uh, we saw it shifted from Babylon to Persia to the Greeks to the Romans. And incidentally, that's just like the prophet Daniel had foretold, which is kind of cool. We saw a lot of fulfilled prophecy last, uh, last week or the week before. Herod is the uh, king of the Jews when Jesus is born. And he himself uh, is descended from Esau instead of Jacob, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but his family was uh, practiced Judaism, as did a lot of the people in that area who uh, were distantly related to the Jews, but not from the line of, of Jacob. The world at the time when Christ is born is relatively peaceful. The Greeks had, remember Alexander the Great? Uh, the Greeks had spread their culture and their language all the way to India. Now when the Persians ruled the world, the Persians pretty much let each culture do what they wanted. The Greeks didn't try to impose Greek culture uh, with punishment for the most part, but they really thought Greek culture was superior. And so they were trying to bring Greek culture, they were almost trying to make be missionaries to, to attract people to their culture. So they built their, their, their baths, and they built their athletic arenas, and they built their places for poetry. And everywhere, they, they, these arenas, uh, amphitheaters, everywhere they went, they brought Greek culture. And so Greek culture now uh, is going all the way from, well, there were some settlements out even to the west, but predominantly uh, basically from, from the little east of Italy all the way over to the borders of India. Greek culture is all over the world at that time, uh, including down in, in Arabia. Uh, at that time, travel by land and sea were probably easier than they had ever been before because you've got Parthia, their powerful empire. You've got Rome, their powerful empire. We've got Pax Romana, Roman peace. They're so powerful that they're able to keep the wars to a minimum, and they're able to keep the pirates to a minimum, and so that travel prospers and trade prospers, the world, in other words, is primed for a big idea. 
an idea can spread rapidly because you've got Latin in the West and Greek in the East and there's roads everywhere, Roman roads, and there's trade routes going everywhere and, and the seas are open for travel. The world is primed and ready. Now, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you say, well, yeah, that's why Christianity is spread. It's not supernatural at all. Uh, it just happened to be that Christ came. If you're a believer in the Old Testament that talks about the coming of Messiah and then you're a believer in the New Testament that talks about what Jesus was all about, you see that God had organized and orchestrated the world so that when Christ came, it was the perfect time for him to come. In the middle of great men and empires, a teenage girl becomes pregnant on the edge of the Roman Empire between Rome and Parthia. Just a teenage girl. By the way, teenage girls had gotten pregnant before. This wasn't new. Just on the edge. Seems insignificant. Why does history remember this? But as Galatians 4.4 4 puts it, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son. The perfect time, the right moment in history, Christ was born. The world was ready for this big explosion. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 1 if you haven't gotten there for it yet. And we're going to skip the genealogies for now. We're going to get back to them. I'm going to read from verse uh, 18. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. This is momentous. We've been waiting years to, to start our study of the New Testament. So here, here we go. This is how. And remember, you're a second, third generation Christian. You're sitting in this, probably a home. Maybe it's early in the morning. Maybe you're a slave. And you, the only way you can do this is if you get to church before 5 in the morning so that you can get home to do your chores. Everybody's gathered in here, and you're hearing this. And you put your faith in Jesus Christ, but now you're getting this message, and somebody's reading from probably a scroll. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. Messiah means uh, the anointed one, the Savior. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now, this is an interesting thing. Maybe you come from a Jewish background. And you've heard of the Holy Spirit. You've heard of the Spirit of God in the Old Testament. But it's a concept that really hasn't been drawn out yet. When you think of Matthew, you think, yeah, we're going to get to know. First chapter, we're going to get to know Jesus. Guess what else? First chapter of the New Testament, you're getting to know the Holy Spirit. So in the Old Testament, we have all these hundreds of years. We see God the Father. And we see glimpses of Christ. And we see glimpses of the Holy Spirit. And then Christ comes, and he has a public ministry of only a few years and the Gospels are all about Jesus. And then the, 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 the epistles after that, they were reflecting back to what happened with Jesus. And there's something that's interesting. Christ is only with us a short time. He says, but something better is going to come. I'm going to send you a helper. Christ returns to heaven, and every single person who puts their faith in Jesus Christ says, Lord God, I know I'm a sinner, but I see your ways are better than my way. I want to live after you. I want to follow after you. I'm going to plant my flag. This is the person I want to be, the life I want to live. Come into my life, Lord God. I want to follow you. That person, God sends you his Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is a little more vague than Jesus. And I think that's that way intentionally. We have God the Father so clearly laid out in the Old Testament. And we have Jesus for a short time on earth. He's God with us, but he's only in one place. He's over there. You get to see him. And the next step is greater intimacy yet. The story of history is God with Adam, walking with Adam, and now we have God <clears throat> coming to a place of even greater intimacy. We have the Holy Spirit. So right here, we were introduced to the, to the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. And in that culture, when you ended uh, an engagement, that was considered divorce. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Wow. Right here in chapter 1. What's this birth all about? 
God invading. Holy God, God the Father, is now in flesh. What is this about? God came down to be among. Why? To save us from our sins. And nobody who has ever really struggled with their own sinfulness cares about that. But if you've tried to be a better person, you've come up face to face with your nastiness, and you want to have a better marriage, and you, you say things you're not proud of, you want to be a better parent, and you act in ways you're not proud of, and, and you're just struggling to have a, a, to be a, I want to be a good person. And if you ever struggled with that, then you know how messed up we really are. And to see God came, God who by all rights could just stomp on me, God came to save me right here in Matthew chapter 1, right at the beginning. We're getting it all. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. So now we're connecting the New Testament, the Old Testament, right away, right at the beginning of the New Testament. Isn't it amazing what Matthew wrote for us here? This is wonderful. Uh, through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. There's some controversy over the word virgin in the uh, Septuagint. Uh, the word is, is virgin. In the uh, Hebrew Old Testament, the word is young girl. Uh, in their minds, it meant the same thing. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he had no union with her until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name of Jesus. Jesus is uh, the way we say his name in English. Uh, that's not what his mom and dad called him, but uh, Jesus is, is, comes from a Greek word for Joshua. Remember Joshua in the Old Testament? But Hebrew doesn't have a J sound. So there's no J, J, Joshua or Jesus. So the name would be pronounced Yeshua, and Yeshua means the Lord saves. So his name means the Lord saves. And incidentally, Jesus Christ, Christ means Messiah in Greek. And Messiah means the anointed one. And an anointed one was somebody God set apart, he anointed them in order to save his people. So the Lord saves, he will save his people, is Jesus Christ. That's his name. He's the Savior. And we get that all right here in the beginning. It was God's will to send the Savior all along. Now, Two weeks ago, remember Jesus versus Thor, we saw the promises from God to Abraham that through Abraham, the entire world was going to be blessed. And it's with Abraham that Matthew begins the record of Jesus' genealogy, uh, and it goes through Jesus. So let's look now at Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to start right away with verse 1 through 6. And we're not even going to read the whole genealogy because... Uh, well, you can, get, you can get a feel for it. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah. So in, remember, in, uh, in Hebrew culture, in Jewish culture, usually the first sentence of the book would be the title. And so we call it Matthew, but the first Christians, the first church may have called this the genealogy or the life and times of Jesus would be a way we translate it in English. The life and times of Jesus. Who is he? The Savior. The son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, this should go without saying, but he's not literally the son of David in the sense that David was his dad. What that means, the word here means is it was his ancestor, and that's why he can be the son of two people. He's the son of David, and he's the son of Abraham. These are both his ancestors, and that's why they call him the son of. Uh, the son of. So, uh, verse 2 there. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah, and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Aminadab, uh, Aminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, Salmon the father of Boaz, uh, whose mother was Rahab, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, uh, by the way, the distance between Boaz, uh, Boaz the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth, uh, Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of King David, 
Boaz lived 300 years after Ruth. So when they said son of, means he's a descendant of Ruth. Now, that's cool. We can trace a line from Abraham to David to Jesus. Now, some people have gone into the Old Testament, looked at those genealogies from Abraham back to Adam, and then if you do that and add up all the numbers, you get a t date for the age of the earth, which is 6,000 years. And that seems on the surface pretty airtight. We, might, uh, we believe in a mighty God. If he wants the world to be 6,000 years old, then the world is 6,000 years old. God says it, I believe it, that settles it. You just follow the genealogies right down, and you can add up their numbers, and you can get to a date that the earth is approximately 6,000 years old. And some people get more specific. Some people even think they can tell the time of day, which I really don't believe. Uh, we've taken a lot of time over the years here. At Foundation Church, what we do a lot with is, is apologetics and proving that the scriptures are, can be trusted. This book is rock solid. We can trust it. It's accurate. It's absolutely reliable. There is no fault in the scriptures at all. I believe these genealogies. I hope you do too. But there's a problem. And I want to be honest, and I'm going to admit, I don't know how to resolve the issue completely. Uh, I may get to heaven and find out that it wasn't what I thought. And, and I'm okay with that. Uh, some people have different ideas about this, that maybe some mistake came into the scriptures or not. But the way I'm going to interpret it today is that there was no error ever came in the translation, or in, the, in the rewriting. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this, chapter 1, and, and say that, no, this is the genealogy that was supposed to be there. None of the names were, were messed, up, messed up. But that, that means that we have some difficulty here, and I don't know all the answers So then why am I bringing this up? Well, that, that's oftentimes pastors won't talk about difficulties. We've never done that at Foundation, and I'm not going to do that. Uh, sometimes churches are afraid to talk about controversy and afraid to talk about difficulties in the scriptures because they're worried people will, will leave their faith. Uh, but the thing is, is you're going to hear about this. If you, you've probably already heard of it. If you haven't already heard of it, you will if you ever talk to a non-Christian who, who has studied some of this stuff, they're going to bring it up. And so I would rather we just throw it out on the table and, and deal with it here. There's some difficulty with Matthew chapter 1, and we can't get around that. Luke also gives us an ancestry of Jesus. And there's some differences. Actually... They're big differences. Actually, they don't match up. Not, not at all. <laughs> the two lists are totally different. Uh, big differences. Between Abraham and Jesus, well, well uh, between Abraham and Jesus, Luke has 14 more generations than Matthew. Luke has 14 generations more than Matthew. And even the generations he, have, he has, they're different names. Again, you're going to hear about this from somebody, and I'd rather we talk about it here at church together. Apparently, Matthew skipped some generations. Well, we already saw that when he goes from Ruth to Boaz, even though the scriptures show us there's this gap of about 300 years here. So we, we come to Matthew and say, oh, yeah, we, and anybody who knew the Old Testament would already know that they're skipping names. There's this gap. Luke starts with Jesus and goes back to Adam, which is because Luke was writing to a Gentile audience. This is a Greco-Roman way of thinking. You start with the present person, you work their way back. Matthew, who's writing, because his gospel came earlier, he's writing to primarily Jewish Christians. Matthew starts with Abraham and goes down to Jesus. And incidentally, he has three sets of 14. What does that mean? I'm a Gentile. That doesn't mean anything to me. Look at uh, verse 17. Thus, there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David. Big division of history. King David comes. 14 generations from David to the exile in Babylon. Well, that's another big division. And 14 generations 
from the exile to the Messiah. Three sets of 14. But he gets there by not counting everybody. That actually kind of bothers me because I'm an American who says, well, if you're going to say it's a genealogy, I want every single name here. I want, I want you to give me the list. It didn't bother Matthew, and I know this because he wrote it that way. He said, three sets of important events with important people, here they are, and it all leads to Christ, who is very important. And I've either got to let him be a first century Jew, writing to first century Jews, or I can be all bent out of shape because he didn't write it for an American living in 2013 to do it the way I would have done it. That's my options. Matthew traces the royal line from David through Solomon to Jesus, and he includes this guy named uh, Jeconiah who said, who God says, none of your descendants will ever sit on the throne. Well, Jesus isn't a blood descendant of him, and that, that line ended, there's nobody sitting on the throne, and now Jesus comes. But his name is included in this list. Isn't that interesting that Matthew would put that in there? He gets this list by not counting everybody. And you can ask yourself, is that fair? Can, can Matthew do that? Is, that? is that allowed? Isn't this Bible supposed to be without error? And again, I say, yes, I believe this genealogy. It is without error. Matthew traces the, the royal line from David through Solomon to Jesus. Luke traces the royal line from David now Matthew goes David, Solomon, Luke goes David, Nathan, who is another son of Jesus, uh, another son of David. And then from then on, the list is different. There's some names that might be the same or might be the same, uh, might be the same name, but different people because their fathers are then listed as different, their ancestors. So Luke traces a line from David to his son Nathan to his son Jesus. Oops. Uh, Sometimes you'll, you'll turn on Discovery Channel or the History Channel, and they'll tell you how, how uh, the gospel writers, the gospels came a long time later, which is not true, and they just copied from each other, and, uh, uh, hello. They just uh, copied from one another, and uh, the reason why the New Testament matches so well with the Old Testament is because they were, they were taking their time, they were writing these details, and they were making it fit. And these same guys will then turn around and say, look at the two lists are different. They didn't, you know, obviously they're wrong. Well, if the guys are spending so much time copying each other and writing it down so it all fits together, which I don't believe, how can you also turn around and say that these two giant lists are different and they didn't realize it? And the people who put the Bible together then, collected all the scripts, they didn't realize it. Apparently, the first generations of Christians were very comfortable with two different lists in Matthew and Luke. So that got me thinking, well, what, what is it that they would see one list here and say, oh, that's good. And they'd see another list in Luke, and they say, oh, yeah, that's scripture. That's good. And they take both lists. Which one is wrong? I already told you, I believe there is no error in scripture. Neither. Neither is wrong, is what I believe. And there's several possibilities. Uh, I already mentioned one, which I don't believe, but Matthew could be tracing Joseph, Joseph's line, and Luke could be tracing Mary's line, even though Joseph's name is at the end of the list. But that would be because Mary's father would have in, adopted in when you, you marry into the family. And so that could be Mary's line. Or Matthew might be tracing how the kingship was handed down through the generations, he actually skips some kings like Ahaziah, Joash, and Amaziah. And Luke's much longer list could be tracing the biological heritage of Christ. Again, maybe through Mary, but not necessarily. So what you have with the, with the list in, uh, in Matthew is here's where the kingship passed down. And after, the, after we get out of the kings in the, in, the, in the Old Testament, we're going through some names we don't know. But this is where the kingship would have happened next. And he, and he brings it down to Christ. Maybe because some uncle and some people over here in this line passed away. So, so it's not a direct biological line, but the kingship passes over to here. You see what's happening? So Matthew is showing where the kingship, the royal line, passed down. But it could be that Luke is giving a biological line. Again, could be through Mary. This is the biological heritage. Or it could be, uh, again, Joseph. 
Thinking about Jewish genealogies, I, I looked at the Old Testament lists as well and found an article online at RTB, which is Reasons to Believe, that shows if we think about the genealogical timelines found in Genesis, uh, if we think these lists are completely inclusive, it comes up with some weird things. Eight of Noah's ancestors would have been alive when his father Lemek was born, including Lemek's great, 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 great grandfather. Most of the ancestors of the people mentioned would have still been alive at the birth of Noah. Now, the Bible never mentions these guys being alive at that time. And that's Methuselah and Noah's dad would have been among the corrupt people in Genesis 6:11 who were swept away by the flood. Now, that's not entirely accurate. This is what the article said. But it could be that Lemek died that year or even the year before, however you count it, and that Methuselah died some, I mean, there's no reason to believe this, but some Christians speculate he died the day before the flood started or the week before uh, because then there would have been uh, seven days and a day of rest or something. I didn't understand all that. But anyways, you have Lemek and Methuselah, their lives ending in the same year as the flood. If, if we have, uh, if this list is uh, conclusive of everybody, Ten post-flood patriarchs were alive when Terah began his family at age 70, including his great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-grandfather Noah. Most of Terah's ancestors were still alive at the birth of Abraham. And it's assumed that he was born when Terah was 130. And so you have guys like Noah being alive when the Tower of Babel happened and Peleg, the dividing of the nations. You wonder why Noah isn't mentioned there. Or, or Noah isn't mentioned during the, the, during the time of Abraham, if the list is conclusive. The article goes on to say, with an omnipotent God in control, it is possible to imagine this genealogy is entirely complete. Yet it seems strange that such a distinguished extended family has not mentioned the stories of Noah. It's not mentioned the stories of Abraham. It's not even mentioned during the time of Babel, when God looks down, sees the sin, he divides the world. One explanation for the genealogies in chapter 5 and 11 is based on the symbolism of numbers. This is why I went back and got this article. You hear that? The lists in Genesis 5 and Genesis 11 have symbolic numbers, which was important to ancient people. The number 10, for example, symbolizes completeness, like the Ten Commandments. It seems noteworthy that Genesis lists 10 patriarchs from Noah to Adam to Noah and 10 from Noah to Terah. And now we see we're getting three lists of 14, 14, 14 in the New Testament. Both eras represent a complete period in the interaction between God and man, considering that the biblical writer's ancient Near Eastern mindset has been, it suggested that Genesis 5 and 11 are symbolically complete lists rather than comprehensive lists. And we see that in the book of Ezra, where it lists a list of the, of the uh, priests. If you compare that to 1 Chronicles, there's six priests missing. Ezra didn't think he was being deceptive. He didn't think he had any need for those names in his list, so he didn't include them there. Moreover, continuing on with this article, two groups of ten generations might be considered a structured genealogy that shows each group is equal in relative importance. An example of such structured genealogy is in Jesus' genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, summarized in verse 17 again, so that all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. From the deportation to Babylon to the time of the Messiah, 14 generations. It's necessary to omit names to generate three groups of 14. And 14 just happens to be the numerical value of David, his name. Each letter of David's name, if you add it up, comes to 14 uh, in Hebrew. And David's name is mentioned repeatedly in chapter 1. And so this book, written to the Jewish people by a Jew, is saying this is all about David, the line of David. God gave a promise to David, and we're seeing its fulfillment in our time. David to Jesus is the point. So if you take this literally, I want to take this literally. How come there's three kings missing? Must not be true. I want to take this literally. How come there's a gap of 300 years between Ruth and Boaz? Must not be true. Or... You can ask the questions that the text was designed to answer and say, if I approach this literally, I have to see what questions, did, what, what answers is Matthew writing so I can come with the right questions. And he's trying to show, in fact, he is showing a clear connection from David right to Jesus. And literally, when you ask the text, 
the right questions, it's literally true and without error. Completely true. Isn't it important to ask the right questions when we come to Scripture? So, is it possible that the list, just think about, is this a possibility that the lists in Luke and Matthew aren't there to give us every name of every ancestor? That the point isn't to start off with a boring list of names, uh, because we have to know why we have to know this. But the real point of the list is to tell us something about Jesus. Maybe that's why Luke wrote it. Maybe that's why Matthew wrote it, because we're going to learn something about who the Messiah is. Is it possible that Matthew's list proves Jesus to be a king and Luke's list proves that he's a priest? Both Gospels were written before 70 A.D. Why is that important? Matthew and Luke written before 70 A.D. In 70 A.D., the Roman army crushed a rebellion among the Jews. They destroyed Jerusalem, and along with it, they destroyed Herod's temple and all the Jew Jewish genealogical records. So when Matthew was written, when Luke was written, it would have been easy to check the genealogical record of Jesus by the records in Jerusalem. We don't have any record that these, uh, his genealogy was challenged. Now, it, it could be dug up someday, but it's interesting at this point that we don't see that the Jewish people, who, the Jewish people challenged everything about Christ. And, and the, the Gentile non-believers challenged everything about Christ. Nobody challenged Matthew chapter 1 in, in, in genealogy in Luke, even when the records were still existing in, uh, in uh, Jerusalem, in the temple. So again, we have several generations of Christians. They collect the Bible. They didn't see a problem with the two lists being different. And their enemies at the time didn't argue with the two lists being different, meaning there must be a sense in which both lists are true. Remember when... Uh, when we began the story last year, and uh, the, we rapid fire went through the entire Bible, uh, we began a story, and we had a, we first did like we did this time. We, we gave a few messages on why we should believe the Bible, why we should see it's rock solid, and then we jumped right into the first part of the story, and we'd watch the cool video with the stick figures, and we, then we'd talk about it. And we looked in the, in the book of Genesis, and I said the exact same thing when we started the Old Testament that I said today when we start the New Testament. You need to write, ask the right questions of the text. Because we bring a 21st century mindset. We bring an American Western culture mindset and say, well, the list should have every name. Well, why? What's the point of that? Would that be accomplishing a list of 14 important events, 14 important people, 14 important people, all in the line of David culminating in this important person, the Messiah, who's a descendant of David. That was the literal interpretation of that. And so we looked back, and we saw that the first two chapters of Genesis, we said this is difficult. Chapter 1 and chapter 2 have a different story of creation. It looks almost like they're in contradiction if we think that the purpose of the first two chapters was to tell us the order. Why do we have the book of Genesis? To tell us the order of how God created. Really? The first book that we get in our Bible, that's so we could, we, we could jot down an order of creation. Or, or if we take the text literally and ask the text, what is it trying to tell us? What is it trying to say? What was Moses trying to teach us through the story of creation? We see that there is no contradiction in the book of Genesis. The first two chapters do not contradict. And we saw that these two chapters are telling us about God, about ourselves, and about creation God was not some deity among many deities. We see one, he is the creator. He's all powerful, and we were made to be like them. Who are we? Genesis answers the question. We're made to be like him, but we've fallen. And we, we are creative ourselves. We can think, we can feel on a different le level than dandelions and gophers, plants and animals. We were intended to be in a relationship with God. We see that right at the beginning. This is the point of creation. Genesis says the whole universe was created so that you, remember that illustration the pastor out in New York does, sets up three chairs and puts a fourth chair in there? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, an eternal loving relationship. And with creation, God pulls up a chair and says, have a seat. And that's what we see in the first two chapters of Genesis. God creating man 
to be into a love relationship with him. Creation doesn't, it was not chaotic. It was not random. It wasn't chance. We see uh, in, in Genesis, God says, land, animals, ocean, fish, sky, birds, every, every place. And then he said, man, garden. What does that show you? We were made for paradise. Every place was created and had a place to be. We were made, and our place is paradise. And that's what God intended us for. And when you approach the scriptures asking the right questions, all the things that people get hung up up about, they go away. Let the Bible say what it says. And don't say, well, I live in the 20th, 20th century, 21st century, and my science teacher said, and I need to make that fit. Why? Moses wasn't writing for that. He wanted to tell you who you are and who God is. And we don't have to demand that the list is exactly like the records down at the Rock County Courthouse. That's not what it's there for. It's there to show us and teach us about Jesus. Genesis understood the right way. Remember? Remember the Copernican Revolution where we say man is, son is no longer the center of the universe, humanity? No. Genesis, when we understand it the right way, guess what it does? It puts you and I, it puts human beings right back in the center of creation because God says it's all about you guys. I came to, I built you guys. I came to be with you guys, walking with you in the cool of the day of the garden. And it's all about God bringing us back in relationship. And Matthew starts by having the creator himself go to the center of creation to restore the relationship we lost in Genesis. The start of the Old Testament, the start of the New Testament, it all fits together. And people miss it because they have to answer some questions which the text was never designed to answer in the first place. And if we go to the genealogies of Matthew and we go to the genealogies in Luke and we're asking them to tell us about Jesus, and again, instead of just assuming they're here so we could be bored by a family list of names, and maybe... We, and, and maybe let's perk it up and try to figure out the age of the earth, as if that's why it was written. Uh, a, a campus minister at InterVarsity was asking this intriguing question of the list in Matthew. He says, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, these women are included in the genealogy and not other women like Sarah. Why? The Adam Clark commentary answers the question this way. Four women are mentioned in this genealogy. Isn't that beautiful? The Messiah of the whole world. And contrary to Jewish culture, you have women's names right there, right there. The Adam Clark commentary answers the question, four women are, are, are mentioned in this genealogy. Two of these were adulteresses, Tamar and Bathsheba. And two were Gentiles, Rahab, probably a prostitute. And Ruth, who was a model of godliness and loyalty. Rahab and Ruth would have been strangers to the covenant promise, and they're there to teach us that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. And that through strangers to his people, we are not on that account excluded from salvation, which God has designed for all men. He is not the God of Jews only. He's the God also of Gentiles. And Matthew puts it right there. You see, the list is more than boring names. God is trying to talk to us through these names. That's beautiful. Each of these women are part of God's amazing plan to bring the Messiah to the world, a messed up, broken world, not a fairy tale, perfect world. The list of people in here, there's, I mean, it starts with Abraham. Remember Abraham? Twice he lies passes off his wife as his sister so that he can save his own skin and get rich at the, at the danger of his wife being raped. And he's right there at the beginning of the list. Tamar, remember her? Her husband uh, dies before uh, she is able to have a child. She's promised another husband by her father-in-law, Judah. Uh, it's a long, sordid story. Uh, Judah was one of Jacob's sons. She ends up getting pregnant by tricking her father-in-law into thinking she was a prostitute. That is messed up. Why is that in the Bible? She pretends to be a prostitute and tricks her father-in-law into sleeping with her? That is messed up. And why would you put that name in the list of Jesus? 
as a little side story, it's a Jew, uh, Jewish tradition in the Midrash Rabbah reports that when Tamar was pregnant and she, she was really showing, uh, she would tap onto her stomach and exclaim, I am big with kings and redeemers, which is kind of interesting. Uh, it's not part of the canon of scripture, but through that girl who was being messed up by, by, by her family, and then she did some things that weren't kosher, <laughs> uh, she was big with kings and redeemers, and from her line came the savior of the world. Why? Why would God allow himself to be descended from a mess like that? Well, I'll tell you what. I've heard Muslims say that Jesus, that this list of people is so messed up, there's no way that a prophet, let alone the Son of God, would come from a family like that. I've heard Christians say Rahab could not have been a prophet, prostitute, because if she was a prostitute, Jesus couldn't have descended from her. I don't know what they do with the other names. They're just hung up on the one. You know what they're doing? To say that God, that any family could be worthy to have God incarnate in their heritage is to bring God down. And it's to elevate humanity. These lists are a real list because we live in a world that's messed up. And this list is a realistic list of a messed up world. And God says, I love you, came up so much. I'm going to go down into the filth. I'm going to go down into broken families. I'm going to go down into selfishness. I'm going to go down into self-righteousness. I'm going to come down there, and I'm going to save you because I love you. And so this list is not a pretty list. This list is a list of messed up, messed up people. And the Redeemer of the world came from this group of people. That's fixing up the mess. Why do we need redeeming? Why do we need to be saved? Because the world's broken and so are we. And Jesus came right down. Real God sees real brokenness in a really messed up planet. And he comes right down in the middle of it. This is not a fairy tale. Look at God came to us because we're so good. God says, don't make me puke. I see your heart. In this list, we see men. We see women. We see Jews. We see foreigners. We see rich. We see poor. We see powerful. We see the weak. We see heroes. And we see villains like King Ahaz. But what we don't see on the list until we get to Jesus, is a perfect person. There are no perfect people in this list. All of them need grace until we come to Christ. In other words, we see real people, real families, real messes, and God uses real things to bring about a very real salvation. And I hope nobody ever feels like, I can't be in church because I'm messed up. I hope nobody thinks, I'm too messed up to be a Christian. Look at the world God came to. God sees, God knows, and he loves us. And we get all of that in Matthew chapter 1. God, thank you for this book. Thank you for this book. And uh, as we go through the rest of this in the weeks and months and years to come, every once in a while, try to think of yourself as being the very first audience to have this scroll unraveled and read to us. And we can see God working in history all the way down to us. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we want to love him because he's loved us so much. And he asked us to follow him. He called us. He commanded us to follow him. And Lord, I pray that we trust your son enough to follow him anywhere. Help us to fall in love with your son, Jesus Christ. And we pray this in his name, in your name, in the name of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Foundation Bible Church. 
and conveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.